Fair all of. Now I'm going to ask Benoit to give us a quick gallop around the world to tell us what's been going on in other countries. Hello. As you uh, might figure out from my name, I'm French, even though I don't speak like this. Um, and of course, it's a challenge being French and coming to an event that says lessons for the UK. We're known for our cultural arrogance, not undeservedly, I should add. And, uh, and, and so I want you to put that aside and think of me as a global analyst currently residing in Shanghai um, it'll, it'll make things a lot smoother. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to touch on very quickly is this question of what do we need? Now, I won't bore you because you've all heard these quotes about IBM and Microsoft talking about five computers in the world and 640K being more than enough for everybody. But the point here is I don't think that businesses are very good at anticipating what people need. What they're good at, and in fact, I had this debate with a journalist recently, and, and I said, do we need iPhones? That's an interesting question. We certainly pay for them. That should be the only relevant point, in my opinion. Um, and as Dana was saying, when they deploy in a building, people pick up. And that really should be the only thing that we're looking at. Um, but speed, in and of itself, what, what are we really talking about? I want to share one graph with you. This is Akamai measured average peak connection speeds for the UK in black and an X part of the UK in red, i.e. Hong Kong. You can see here that in 2007, peak load for individual users on average was double in Hong Kong than what it was in the UK. It's now more than double, and it seems like the gap is widening. Now, in Hong Kong, you can get a gigabit if you live on Hong Kong Island or Kowloon, um, or the New Territories, you can get a gigabit more or less anywhere, and it's around 25 US dollars for a gigabit. If you live on some of the smaller islands, it's a different, uh, a different issue. Um, and actually, PCCW has recently launched a 10 gigabit service, and Hong Kong, Hong Kong Broadband Network is working on matching that. The point I wanted to make here is this. If you deploy the right infrastructure, the marginal cost of offering a gig over 100 meg, or even to some extent 10 gig over a gig, is very small, which means that once you have that infrastructure in place, whatever the need is, you can match it. It's an important point to keep in mind. Now, here, we have been hearing that basically GFAST was the holy grail. It was the thing that was going to make the copper network work forever and deliver what we need. I wanted to share a few points with you about GFAST. GFAST is a great technology. It really is a great technology. Do you know what the main use case for GFAST is from telcos? The use case is someone wants our 100 megabit fiber service. They call. We show up with a big drill in our hands, and they go, oh, no way. You're not drilling into my house. So what do you use GFAST for? To bridge those last four meters. You reuse the last bit of copper, and you put your fiber equipment outside the door. That is the main commercial use case for GFAST today. That's not to say it's the only use case, but that's the point where that's got fiber operators excited about GFAST. <laughs> Second point. Do you know how much GFAST costs? I'm actually surprised at how little that question gets asked. When I talk to Alcatel or Weiwei and I say, how much does a GFAST install and equipment cost? They say, exact same price as a fiber to home install and equipment. So if that's the case, and I encourage you to test this for yourselves if you're interested in that point, then why are we using GFAST if we could deploy fiber for the same cost? Interesting question. Top theoretical speeds of 500 megabits per second in a laboratory will only be available with GFAST for those who are extremely close <laughs> to the node. And the speeds are going to drop very fast from there. This is actually a very important point and something that I don't think a lot of people realize if we're talking about nation building. Quality of service predictability is not something we can expect to have with GFAST. Why is this important? I tried to 
visualize this, uh, the predictable versus the unpredictable. If you deploy fiber to the premises, basically for 80% plus of households, you will know, anyone who wants to offer services will know what these households can get in terms of quality of service. And then on the outer edges, you will have less predictable bandwidth and latency and all of these elements. If you look at copper enhancement technologies, what you will get is this. Someone talked about Swiss cheese. It's actually more complex than Swiss cheese because there's different levels of holes. Basically, for 100% of the network, you will not be able to anticipate what the end user has. And that is very important because what we're talking about here is not people watching YouTube or um, doing online games. Of course they will, and that's fine, and that's part of what sustains the economy. But what we're talking about here is government saying, okay, how can I lower my cost of operations, deliver better services using connectivity? And if I cannot anticipate whether my citizens have or don't have the required connectivity to operate, I cannot do that. So the whole mental framework that you need for public services to be rethought, for healthcare to rethink itself, for energy, all of these things require predictability. If you don't have predictability, you cannot move into that next phase. And that, I, I was talking to one of the Bell Labs top thinkers recently, and he said to me, internet hasn't really revolutionized anything yet. Everything that has happened so far is basically evolutions of existing businesses and models. The next phase is now. And that phase is going to see a whole lot of new things, a whole lot of revolution, and a whole lot of disruption on a scale we can't even imagine. And the benefits are enormous. But we need to have the underlying infrastructure that allows us to anticipate that we can actually deliver these services to the end users. And that is not the case with the copper enhancement technologies. And I think that's a much bigger issue than what speed we'll be able to deliver in the end. Actually, if I may, speed is important. Latency is way more important. And we're not focusing on that at all. Latency is going to be the difference between a smart healthcare service saving a life or not saving a life. That's what we should be thinking about. OK, so the topic of the day, let's not kid ourselves, is structural separation. But, but the point I wanted to make before going there is what I think is a very important point. Fiber is not expensive. And when I say fiber, I mean FTTP. It's not expensive. Expensive is the absolute wrong word to talk about this. Why? Because the investment cost is not the issue. The investment case is the issue. And it's the issue because we have been expecting companies whose market outlook is to have three to five year profitability on anything they invest in, to invest in networks that are only going to deliver value in 10 to 15 years. That disconnect is what creates the issue. And I would argue that public subsidies, and this is not a lesson to the UK, it's a lesson to every country in the world that's put public subsidies on the table for this. Public subsidies have not made an unviable business case viable. Public subsidies have allowed non-infrastructure companies to consider infrastructure business cases, which means that if we talk to infrastructure companies in the first place, we might not have needed these subsidies to get the same outcome. In fact, potentially to get better outcome. This is a very important point, because as it's been said in the first panel, the funding exists. The investment is there. In fact, um, you might not be aware that um, O2 Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic incumbent, underwent a voluntary structural separation in the last year. Unfortunately, they're not listed, so we can't do the kind of comparison that Vanessa showed in terms of share prices. But anecdotally, when I talk to people involved in that project, what I hear is that infrastructure funds were literally walking over each other to go and talk to them. The money is there, it's ready to be invested, but it will not go to telcos. Because what these guys are looking for is 20 year steady returns. And that kind of predictability you will not get in a telco business model. And there's nothing wrong about that, that's just the way the world works. So 
That leads us to, in my opinion, a slightly different angle when we're talking about structural separation. Why? Because the core argument that we hear about the necessity for structural separation is market fairness, right? Level playing field. Basically, you own the infrastructure, you also operate on the retail market, of course you benefit from that. And, you know, there's 1,500 ways to argue that they don't, but the reality is that there's 15 million ways for them to benefit from it. And it's not just BT, it's happening everywhere. So again, you know, not targeting this specifically at the UK. The problem is, I have never seen this argument work because telco lobbying is just too powerful. And in Brussels, in the last tenure, the cruise tenure, the term structural separation was actually not even mentioned anywhere. Telco lobbying managed to completely kill that discussion. It never happened. So I don't have a lot of faith in that argument carrying the day, even though I think from a market perspective it is an important argument. Now there are two more arguments which I think are much more interesting and much more worth considering. The second argument is shareholder value. If you align the risk levels of the infrastructure part of the business and the risk level of the service part of the business with shareholders who are comfortable with those risk levels, you will get better outcomes. And what that means on the infrastructure side is that long-term investment becomes possible on its own terms. It doesn't necessarily require an external input of money. Um, there's a gentleman in the room, which I encourage you to go and talk to, um, uh, Babrushka Dalibor, who has written about this from a financial perspective, and he's got a number of paper out there. If you Google his name, you will, you will find them. Uh, we had a discussion a couple of weeks ago on this, and uh, I asked him, why are all of your colleagues not sharing your views? And, and one of the things he said is, well, they'll be, they're building in the first argument in the valuation. In other words, because the market is unfair, BT's valuation is actually delivering more than it should. Therefore, structurally separating them is, is not in our best interest because we're not sure that the valuation in a structurally separated environment. But that's kind of, I mean, it's logical, but it's also kind of nonsensical because if you argue that first argument is untrue, then you can't say that it weighs on the second argument. But the, the point I want to make here is that I think rationally analyzing this and doing it at a financial level, which I'm not capable of doing, but I think a lot of people in the room might be, would be an invaluable contribution to this debate. And I think someone here uh, needs to look into this from a financial perspective and hopefully share that openly and transparently so that everybody can weigh in on that debate. And to be perfectly honest, and this is not a dig on the people from OpenReach who are here, I don't believe that BT and OpenReach have considered this as a possibility. I think from the start, this has been put aside as, no, we don't want this. And, and I think that analysis might actually turn out to be really interesting for BT themselves. The third argument is the nation building argument. Now, remember what I said earlier, I don't think the subsidies were needed. I speak to infrastructure investments and they say, oh, if we could buy the rural parts of the copper network that fiber is never going to deploy in ever, we would deploy fiber over 15 years just on the basis of those cash flows. Just the certainty of that revenue would allow us to find the funds to do a long-term infrastructure deployment. Now, what that means is that if you are looking for a solution, and I kind of understand the UK government is a tad cash strapped right now. If you're looking for a solution to get the outcome of a sustainable national infrastructure in telecoms without or with minimal public funding, it seems to me that structural separation should be considered as a viable mechanism. And the point I will finish on is this. If that is not the outcome that is chosen, then the alternative is not the status quo. Because basically you have two models. Either you say we need one national infrastructure that is structurally separate from any of the market players, 
but that everybody will use. Therefore, it'll get maximum usage and minimal CapEx investment in terms of what it will deliver. Best use of assets, in other words. If you say that's not the model, then what you're saying is infrastructure competition is the model. And I'm sorry to say this, but the conditions for infrastructure competition in the UK do not exist. In Portugal, we have infrastructure competition. In Lithuania, we have infrastructure competition. How did they achieve that? National open ducts, very low rates. Today, you can't get access to open reaches ducts. You can. So if structural separation is not the solution, I would argue then Ofcom needs to look at other remedies, opening up the ducts, reselling of dark fiber nationwide to create the framework for infrastructure competition. Thank you very much.